good afternoon everyone uh, welcome to this weekly uh, seminar session that uh, we have i am happy to uh, inform you that today we are starting with the first students presentations of this year and uh, today we have two students presenting uh, one the first one is miss neha morya from msc part 1 biochemistry and the topic that uh, she will be talking on is types of biological and chemical databases the second presentation will be by miss uh, akshata bhosle she is from msc part 1 chemistry and her topic is emergence of nanoplastic in the environment and possible impact on human health so uh, i just uh, an information to the speakers both of you will have 30 minutes all together 20 minutes you will get to present your content and 10 minutes will be for the discussion after that okay so without taking more time i request miss neha to start with her presentation Uh, good afternoon everyone my name is neha morya from uh, msc biochemistry part 1 and i'll be presenting uh, types of uh, biological and chemical databases so to start with the definition a uh, database is a collection of information uh, that is uh, organized so that it can be easily accessed managed and updated so biological database basically contains uh, and stores uh, most of the biological information it is structured uh, indexed and updated released and also contains cross references uh, along with hyperlink the database here uh, basically uh, the the moment new data uh, is entered or new data the findings of new data uh, is updated regularly here Uh, the applications of database uh, it helps the researchers to study the available data and from a new and from a new species antiviruses uh, helpful bacteria medicines etc it also helps scientists to understand the concept of biological phenomena uh, the database acts as a storage of information so it is shared uh, worldwide uh, the information about genomes uh, nucleotides proteins Uh, many other species, etc. Uh, it gives the uh, initial or the preliminary uh, studies for any research. It also contains information of any other uh, species, genome, protein, uh, of mutations or evolutionary relationship. Primary databases. Uh, the first is the uh, nucleotide repository, which contains a uh, Uh, contains the nucleotide uh, the, uh, sequences. There are three main important databases: DBJ, that is DNA Data Bank of Japan, uh, hosted by National Center for Genetics; the uh, Gene Bank, hosted by NCBI; uh, National Center for Biotechnology; EMA, uh, European Nucleotide Archive. or uh, the ene uh, which is hosted by molecular biology laboratories all the uh, uh, important uh, database makes the international nucleotide sequence database collaboration uh, here the nucleotide uh, i mean the data of nucleotide are updated and uh, are, can be accessed at any point from any place this is the ncbi website Uh, which contains many uh, databases. The one we have just now talked about, the Gene Bank. So the moment you open the uh, NCBI website, uh, you get so many databases. Uh, you can be accessed. Here, I have this is one example. It's uh, the Streptococcus aureus strain T. 
um, just to show how the uh, database gives the information. So the moment you uh, enter the uh, name of any uh, organism or whatever your topic is in the search tool, uh, it gives the exception number, locus, information about the uh, species, uh, the nucleotide. And the moment you click on pasta, this pasta, uh, it gives the entire sequence of uh, the nucleotide sequence of that organism. Then the protein data basis. The first one is the PDB. This is the protein data bank. Uh, it gives information mm -hmm. of uh, any protein, protein uh, and also it helps to visualize them in the 3D form. form. This is a serographic database for the three dimensional structure of large biological molecules such as protein. So, information here are derived from three sources. Uh, structures are, are determined by acrylic crystallography, NMR experiment, and molecular modeling. This is the CDB website database. Uh, along with uh, search tool, it also gives the CDB one and one, uh, which which gives information of any updated uh, protein, the structure information, and etc. The search tool helps us to uh, find anything uh, with a single click. This is example of one uh, protein. Uh, so the moment uh, you enter the search, it uh, searches and gives the, uh, this is first page, which gives the structure summary, it contains everything, how it was derived, and uh, what it is. Classification means function, the organism name from where it was taken. If there is any mutation, it tells that also. Then a 3D view. Uh, the 3D view, this is a 3D view. It gives you uh, like uh, to view for the molecule, the annotations, uh, experiment, how it was taken. The sequences, genomes, if it is any, if it is, has any ligands, it has any other versions, it all can be displayed here and it can be also downloaded. Why PDB did, uh, uh, this is based? So basically, PDB uh, helps us to visualize the molecule complexity and analyze it, uh, the interactions, the molecules. Uh, the structure, function, and other relationships. Uh, compare its structure with other molecules, how it is different, uh, and how different interactions, such as uh, hydrogen bonds, uh, wind wall interaction, how which uh, molecules or which residues are involved in. Everything can be visualized using this and studied uh, in detail. The protein. Then it can be uh, used for engineering or designing, like. Uh, uh, you can mutate the protein, edit, uh, delete it. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there are Swiss plot and TRAND. So, Swiss plot basically uh, is also a primary protein data bank uh, which contains highly curated protein sequences and uh, it along with other information about the sequence and all, it contains information of any uh, uh, post translation modification, uh, example like uh, acetylation or phosphorylation, if there are any binding sites, etc. TR Ember is a, also a primary um, protein database which uh, and it contains information uh, from computational uh, translation of nucleotides. Basically, uh, we have uh, studied that. Uh, from DNA, uh, pre-RNA is uh, transcribed and it undergoes uh, modification. Then the pre-RNA, the mRNA is translated into protein. With this, uh, the database helps us to uh, determine the proteins which are directly translated from DNA. So it contains both uh, functional and non-functional proteins uh, because uh, after uh, Transcription mRNA undergoes uh, splicing, and this uh, database it translates DNA as it is. 
secondary database secondary database contains data derived uh, from the results of analyzing primary data it helps us basically uh, example uh, like swift dot or uh, pdb and other uh, uh, database like crm so uh, all those contains uh, different data this database helps us to compile everything in show so instead of searching one thing at one one uh, database one can search the same thing and compare the results uh, using this database for visualization there are uh, different software one is that most uh, the three important or uh, highly used uh, software one is redmol for visualization of uh, proteins nucleic acid and small molecules uh, 3d uh, c and 3d means i c in 3d it helps uh, the to view any uh, molecules uh, using uh, ncba entrad structure database these are the logos of the uh, software and the primary Primal is also highly used and uh, to visualize, to manipulate the structure, uh, to study the interactions with ligands and uh, molecular docking also. So, uh, if I get a time, like in the end, I'll can show the, uh, the I can show the um, working of this software. and how this helps us to you know study the protein or any other molecule uh, how the active site work how the uh, molecule interacts with other uh, this uh, ligands how, which are the residues or atoms involved in what are the distance of them everything can be studied using this tool uh, this is a, a swiss model um, So this uh, basically helps us to you know, predict the structure of any protein sequence. Um, when a new uh, sequence of a protein is determined, uh, then uh, this tool can help us to predict the tertiary structure of the protein. So here you have to enter the uh, your sequence and then click on build model. it takes a while but it gives the uh, proper uh, 3d structure of the protein and from here you can use other softwares or this or uh, like pdb or uh, like compare it with pdb protein and uh, use like primal uh, software to study this molecule in detail next we have chemical databases top uh, chem which is highly used uh, chemical database it is the largest chemical database uh, organized as a three link database with the ncbs entrad information retrieval system uh, it gives information of any compound uh, its properties uh, chemical physical if it is any toxicity uh, where it is available how it is used if it is it, if it has any pharmacological importance everything can be studied from this uh, chemical database this is an example uh, using the ncbi pop chem uh, which we uh, just saw so it gives the information this is the title and the summary page then uh, when you click on structure it gives the 3d 2d crystal structure of the compound then it also helps us to identify how the if the compound is given to us how can we identify this um, then structural information uh, other related records chemical uh, if there are any vendors who sell this chemical that also information you get from here uh, and how it is manufactured if it is manufactured then a uh, drug bank just like a uh, perkin drug bank also gives the information of uh, many drugs and target information it contains extensive data on the nomenclature ontology chemistry uh, chemistry structure function action uh, 
pharmacology, basically everything how the uh, drug can work. E molecules uh, is also uh, gives the information of commercial compounds. Uh, it also has a, a tool which helps us to identify any compound. So we have to just draw the structure uh, in the uh, toolbox and then it uh, instantly search over 8 million unique chemical structures uh, and gives us the information of that chemical. It also helps, helps us when we don't know the name of the chemical structure. I mean, the, uh, so we can find out by using this uh, e-monitor. ChemID Plus is also um, helps us to quickly search any chemical compound, toxicity, physical properties, structure, etc. This is the uh, page of the ChemID Plus which is also hosted by NCBA NIL. So here, uh, uh, can enter a compound name and it has uh, also find out the, if it has any toxicity, like LD50, LD, uh, LC50, or any other toxicity, uh, if they were conducted on which organism, then the physical properties, uh, uh, if you uh, don't know the name, then you can draw the structure and then search for it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Neha. Uh, the session is now open for discussion. If students have any questions or any faculty members, you may please ask. Yes, Dr. Sandesh. Yeah, thank you, Prachi. Uh, Neha, it was a very nice and informative presentation you did. Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, so many uh, databases you have covered up. Now, one thing I would like to know is now, since you have, you know, uh, covered up so many databases for, you know, structural proteins and everything, uh, according to you, which is, you know, one of the best and reliable database? That depends what you want. If you want just the information of any, uh, like say, I say a protein or anything, then I'll go for NCBA. NCBA has the vast, uh, you have to literally, you know, uh, then filter it out what you don't want because it okay. contains extensive information. Okay, okay. And are, are these all our paid facilities? These all are free facilities. Uh, we all can go and use it, except uh, Resmol and Pymol. Resmol, you have to download it, and Pymol, you have to send an uh, email to them asking you want uh, uh, this, so they give you a license number. I have installed the uh, Pymol. Uh, if anyone is interested, I can show how to use it and all. So they immediately give you, uh, the, but while you're registering, you have to register as a teacher or a student. I have registered okay. as yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, nice. Yes, Dr. Uh, Kanchanmala has to ask something. Actually, my question was something regarding that paid all only. So, a part of question has all, already been answered by Neha that uh, some of them, they are paid and for some, you may need to write a mail. And is it, uh, this is just a uh, general information. Uh, in our window software, can we have uh, visualize everything or we need to have something special on this? Uh, Ma'am, can I show you this? Because if I show you, you understand better. Uh, okay. Please just take up one minute. Please. Huh? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. So this is Pymol. You get a license number. If everything comes here. Uh, so you have to just enter the license number here and the uh, software starts working. So here you have to uh, first either you can download any uh, structure or you if you uh, has like the like computer has an internet connection, then you can just write fetch. Fetch and whatever number uh, you 
want, like the protein number, the expression number, or the name from the PDB. PDB has doesn't have like uh, if you want to find out about hemoglobin, the you type hemoglobin, but it has a particular number. So I'm just typing. I have one num number. So it's two E C E. So the moment you uh, fetch and uh, enter it, you get the molecule. Uh, can you see that, ma'am? Yes. Yes. I can yes. see clearly. So yes, so it has many commands. One I can show is display. Display you can uh, click on sequence and it will give the sequence of this protein. This is a neurological protein. So and then uh, it has one ligand. So I have to zoom it uh, so that I can show this here. So you can rotate this. This all asterisk mark are the hydrogen bond. So how this hydrogen interact with this ligand? How this molecule is assembled? Everything can be studied using this. Uh, if I just go and say hide, this will hide the uh, water molecule. Like Maybe some other time, if when we have lots of time, I can show you the how to use this. Uh, since we are like, yeah, yeah, but I got some idea. Thanks, thanks yes. for your answer. Yes. Dr. Roshan. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, a really nice presentation, Neha. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, what I would like to know from you is how do you <clears throat> plan to use these? Uh, do you plan to use any of uh, this database for your research work subsequently uh, when you go part two or I don't know? How do you plan to use them and how can you be uh, sure <clears throat> that the data that you obtain is uh, is valid? How do you plan to check it? Because, <clears throat> uh, yeah, you, you get my question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So uh, first, uh, I'm already using these databases like NCBI and everything else. Even to uh, visualize this structure, sometimes it's fun to you know see the animated form of this uh, structure. So last time we had uh, FOB, Fundamentals of Biomolecules. Uh, Patching and had taught so many uh, proteins and tertiary structures and code. But uh, the studying and uh, visualizing it is a different way. So this is one way you, as a student I'm using it and yeah uh, about validation or reliability. So NCBI doesn't con uh, or any other uh, database doesn't contain just the information. It contains the journal, it contains the uh, information, it contains the link from where it was taken and it, first of all it is first checked by different scientists so it's curated. It is just not taken from any website. Uh, now, uh, since uh, many less people know about databases, uh, if you go to lower classes like 12th standard or even some uh, at part of BSc, uh, people, uh, when we are given an assignment, uh, everyone just go on the website and take the information from any web page or, or any website. But uh, NCBI or PDB or any other uh, databases gives you reliable data. And they are experimentally uh, obtained. So yes, these all are uh, reliable sources. Okay, yeah, thank you. I think uh, you made a good point there because for each of these in the PDB database, for example, you can refer to the original uh, papers to cross check what you see. Yeah, you can start with a known protein and you can cross check. Yeah, very good. I'm really appreciate. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any more questions? So, if there are no questions, I thank Neha for the presentation and a good interactive session as well. Uh, I now request the next candidate for uh, for the today's seminar, Ms. Akshata Bosley, to kindly start with her presentation. Thank you, Neha, for the, for your presentation. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, can you tell me if my screen is uh, presented? Can you see my screen? Yes, it is getting presented. Just give me a minute. Yes, ma'am. 
Maybe yeah. once it comes, I'll tell you. Can you see the slides? Yes, yes, we can see the slides. Yeah. Hmm? Just try to scroll. Just try to scroll to the next slide. I have started the slideshow. Can you see um, if the first slide is there on the screen? Yeah, we can see the introductory slide. Okay. Can you confirm that now I'm changing the slide? You can see the second that I yes. changed? Yes, I oh. think it's going fine. Yeah. Hmm? Just, okay. just click on that hide uh, option yeah. which is there. Yeah, just one second. Yes, thank oh, you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Good start. Yeah. So, uh, good afternoon to everybody who is uh, present in this uh, during this presentation. I'm uh, Akshata Bhusle from MSc Part One Chemistry, Goa University, and uh, I'm going to talk on the topic of uh, emergence of nanoplastic in the environment and its possible impact on human health. Um, I'm going to present this paper by the same title, Emergence of Nanoplastic in the Environment and Possible Impact on Human Health. Um, this is taken from the journal Environmental Science and Technology. This journal has an impact uh, factor of 9.028 in the year 2020. So coming to our topic, um, synthetic polymers. So we know polymers are of two types. We have natural polymers and synthetic polymers. So natural polymers, we have proteins, cellulose, and so on. In this, we will be dealing with the synthetic polymers, namely plastics. So we know that the synthetic polymers are one of the most important classes of materials of the 21st century. They are wide utility manufacturing and um, uh, production is uh, humongous and its utility amongst um, all the spheres of, um, uh, you know, uh, their use basically, it cannot be underestimated in the 21st century. Um, so before diving into the topic, if I were to define what are microplastics or nanoplastics, then uh, basically the macroplastics which are there, that are, that is the bigger uh, particle, bigger plastic objects, it is uh, found through studies that they fragment and they undergo degradation to produce finer particles, which are the microplastics or the nanoplastics. Now, microplastics are the plastic particles whose size is in the micro uh, micrometer range, that is ranging from one micrometer to five millimeters. And it is, uh, it is confirmed through studies that these microplastics undergo further degradation to produce nanoplastics, wherein the plastic Thick particle size is more smaller that is now it is in the nanometer range that is it is from one nanometer to one millimeter now these nanoplastics which are they or the microplastics they are chemical and physical properties are now different than that of the microplastics by virtue of its now increased surface area because of its reduced size so they are reactivity with um, you know their reactivity to different um, substances in our ecosystem its ability to leach into um, you know the Food, its ability to climb the food chain, everything changes because of its now reduced size. This uh, picture basically it depicts that uh, man has created the bottle, that is the plastic bottle, man created synthetic polymers, plastic. This plastic undergoes degradation to produce further finer particles, which are the microplastics or the nanoplastics, which get into the aquatic systems. Now, it is easier for these uh, microplastics and nanoplastics to enter into the oceans because that is where everything is washed into, right? So then we have the shellfishes, the bivalves, which take up these nanoplastics or microplastics into their uh, systems and uh, through the food chain when the man consumes these shellfishes it again these nanoplastics go into the body the system of the man and uh, the adverse effects and the uptake of these uh, nanoparticles into the, the cellular uptake into the human body and everything we will be talking about in this presentation further now um, the synthetic polymers basically are classified into four groups we have the thermoplastic polymers or plastic the thermosetic polymers or thermosets elastomers and synthetic fibers strictly speaking only the first group and the subsets of the third and the fourth group have to be referred to as plastics because their characteristics are such 
but um, it is seen that most of the synthetic polymers in the environment are found to be of thermoplastic origin, which is why uh, the environmental science um, community has chosen to refer to all synthetic polymers in the environment as plastics uh, itself. So synthetic polymers are produced uh, from petroleum-based raw materials. And as I've said, that their vast and wide utility and production um, is based on its physical and chemical properties, which are definitely beneficial. And also due to its low processing and production cost, it finds the popularity that it does. And uh, these uh, plastic materials are added during the formulation. They are added with additives. Now, these additives are stabilizers, flame retard. Stabilizers are the substances which are added to render stability to the substance, to the final product, so that it remains stable under fluctuations of temperature or anything. Then flame retardants are basically making, they make the substance resistant, resistant to flames, fillers, uh, plasticizers. Uh, plasticizers render flexibility to the final product. As you see, there's the, the pipe picture. So um, plasticizers are added and the pigments which render color to the, uh, to the, to the plastic, the microplastic. In the past 60 years, it is seen that the production of these um, synthetic polymers have increased many fold. In 2016, around 335 million metric tons of plastic was produced with trillions of dollars in terms of the global economic returns, China definitely being the leading producer. This graph, um, it shows a comparison of the plastic production uh, in the world scenario as compared to that in Europe. Now the red bars which you see, it is it shows the production of plastic in Europe and the world, uh, you see the blue bars. So it is seen that in Europe, the production of plastic has been stabilized over the year. This range is from 1950 to 2016. So in Europe, it is stabilized. Now this is because of two reasons. It is uh, the economic crisis from 2007 to 8 and also because of higher energy and uh, higher prices of the raw material causing to an increased price of the final product which puts it at a lesser competition uh, with uh, flourishing Middle Eastern um, countries but uh, keeping Europe aside Europe it has stabilized but if you see the world scenario the production of plastic has just increased and it does not uh, seem to stop or reduce is so like very far away it does not seem to stabilize it is just increasing and it is a matter of great great concern so coming to the degradation of the microplastics to microplastics or nanoplastics, there are four uh, basic uh, methods. Um, these include the physical and the chemical methods. So we have photodegradation, oxidation, hydrolytic degradation, and mechanical disintegration. All these methods are together referred to as weathering. So photodegradation is wherein the basically the UV region, the ultraviolet radiation from sunlight, it is said to uh, break the chemical bonds in the synthetic polymer, uh, changing its chemical and physical properties. And it is also said to affect the additives which are uh, added uh, into the microplastics. And uh, photodegradation also initiates the weathering process. Oxidation is the oxidation of the microplastics under the atmospheric condition. Now, polyamide bonds in them, um, they can undergo hydrolysis that is in the presence of water, the ester or the amide bonds can break, causing a further reduction in its mechanical strength of the microplastic where it can adsorb water which further causes more uh, you know breaking down and mechanical disintegration is it includes all the physical processes like maybe grinding or you know um, friction or something you know in the atmosphere so the microplastics can break down into finer uh, particles so uh, various studies have been done to estimate the overall global plastic waste and also the various studies have been done to estimate the mass of the plastics which are floating or which are uh, you know entering into our oceans because these are the global ecosystems which are most affected by the plastic pollutants so this is a picture of a plastic sample taken from an expedition in the ligurian sea in may 2018 by the sail and explore association in a 30 minute um, basically a 30 minute um, journey 
trail with a mesh size of 0.3 mm so this is like a sieve so the gaps or the mesh which is there it the size of those gaps are 0.3 mm so it allows the particles of 0.3 mm or lesser than that to pass through so this is used for separation of basically microplastics various studies have been conducted now i'm referring to the journal which was in 2020 as i said right but uh, i'm sure after that in 2021 uh, you know now in 2022 also after that many studies must have done and this number must have increased only so in mediterranean sea mediterranean sea is the most polluted sea on the planet uh, it has a record breaking number of 1.25 million microplastic fragments per square kilometer floating uh, in the sea and uh, there was also a study which was done by Erickson et al. He reported that a minimum of 5.25 trillion plastic particles with a weight of up to 2,70,000 tons is uh, floating in the world's oceans. And numerous other studies uh, uh, confirm such numbers. Sources and fate of plastic in the environment. Now, approximately 50% of plastic products are, uh, as we know, it's a sad thing that they're produced for single-use applications and then they're discarded. And uh, microplastics represent the main source of plastic litter. And uh, in the environment, once it is in the environment, it is uh, very sad that it leads to entanglement, especially of the small animals or, uh, uh, you know, it's very common side that we see cattle uh, also, right? So you see that they eat those plastic bags or anything. It results in entanglement, ingestion, and it is retained by seabirds, uh, fishes, and cetaceans. Cetaceans are marine um, mammals, uh, which often die from related causes such as starvation. Now, this is a very gruesome picture, but uh, it's a real picture from the shores in Philippines. A whale was washed onto the shores with... 40 kgs of plastic in its uh, body. So microplastic, uh, microplastic particles affect greater number of organisms, especially the primary consumers, which are lower in the food chain, uh, such as zooplankton, that is the first picture, zooplankton. Then we have bivalves, which are the shellfishes, and also small fishes, uh, because they are, uh, uh, they are uh, mechanism of ingestion is quite basic and simple. And they also do not have very complex, uh, you know, pathogen clearing uh, mechanisms in their body. So all these substances very easily go into their systems, retain, and then they climb up the food chain and enter into the body of humans as well. Uh, in personal care products also, you will find these microplastics, nanoplastics used very freely, very openly uh, in toothpaste, in facial scrubs, uh, you know, always these polyethylene-based microplastic particles are also always like added. They can end up in the wastewater and uh, they can also directly end up into the human system, you know, through skin or uh, sometimes through ingestion as well. Now these uh, microplastics or nanoplastics are found everywhere, you know, in the polar region ranging, um, you know, you can see them frozen in Arctic ice to the open waters in the equator, to the coastal areas and also in the deep sea. Now, uh, previously I had talked about photodegradation, uh, the method which is used for breaking mac my, uh, the macroplastics to, you know, the nano or the microplastics. So Lambert et al. did an uh, experiment, he did, uh, he did an experiment to produce nano uh, plastics so what he did was that he took um he took disposable polystyrene coffee cup li lids and he exposed them to ultraviolet light and uh, he did this study and you can see on the graph that it was found that day seven you can see the peak of the production of these nanoparticles is uh, there's a peak on day 14 the peak is more on day 28 it is rising day 56 it is much higher so he showed that, you know, these polystyrene coffee cup lids, when they were exposed to this UV light, it results in the fragmentation, the breaking down of these uh, materials and the production of nanoparticles. So the very important conclusion, which, you know, it was, which could be drawn from this is that the macroplastics, which are lying so very openly into the landfills, you know, very openly on our earth surface, basically under the hot sun, it is concluded that because it is under the sun's radiation and it is exposed to the UV, light it is producing nanoparticles now in this study we have seen that on day 56 so many like nanoparticles are produced but all these plastics are lying on the earth surface for so many so many years and so many so much amount of nanoparticles and microplastics are produced and are being produced 
so effects of nanoplastics on the aquatic environment now um, experimental studies uh, using model polystyrene nanoparticles have shown various organisms like daphnia daphnia are uh, microscopic insect like um, um, organisms which are there in the um, the water bodies, various organisms like Daphnia, Mussel, Zooplankton and Algae can actively ingest nanoplastic particles or they can also absorb them to their surface. So there was uh, one um, study which was done by Kanesi et al. He did a study on hemocytes. Hemocytes are the uh, blood cells, you can say, of uh, mussels, insects. So he did a study on the hemocytes of a mussel, the marine uh, bivalve, Mytilus galloprovincialis. So what he did was that he took polystyrene particles which were functionalized with amino groups and uh, he exposed this, uh, this muscle to this amino functionalized polystyrene particle for about an hour. It was found that there is an increased extracellular reactive oxygen species were produced and it resulted in the cell apoptosis that is the cell bursting in the muscle within an hour which shows that there is an interaction between the nanoparticle and uh, the body of this uh, muscle. Um, various other studies have also been done uh, in which there is an exposure to polystyrene nanoparticles have said to have deleterious impact on planktonic stages of oysters as well. Uh, Brenz et al. He did a very interesting study. He took uh, polystyrene nanoparticles, combined them with carbamazepine. Now carbamazepine is a drug which is uh, very easily detected. Um, not very easily detected. It is the most uh, detected uh, in the environment. Now, carbamazepine is a drug which is used for treating epilepsy. It is effective for fits, seizures, nerve pain, etc. So, in the combination of carbamazepine with polystyrene nanoparticles, he exposed this to the Mediterranean muscle, the same one previous slide, well, Mytilus galloprovincialis, for 96 hours to a range of concentrations of 110 nanometer. It was found that, uh, you know, various bio markers on the gills, on um, uh, the digestive uh, glands, and also on the hemo uh, lymph, it was found that there was genotoxicity which is shown on the hemocytes. This is one thing. Second thing, there was also a um, uh, conclusion was drawn that it also results in down regulation of gene expression. So gene expression is not done, so proteins will not be produced. So it showed an impact on uh, these two things. And Wigner et al. also did a study that showed that 30 nanometer polystyrene particles when tested at concentration of 0.1 to 0.3 gram per liter have an adverse effect on the feeding behavior of blue muscle metallus edilis. So it showed uh, uh, an adverse effect on its filtering ability because they're filter feeders So um, on that. So the impact of nanoplastic on human health. Now these nanoplastics can enter inside the human body via three basic mechanisms, oral, uh, sorry, not oral inhalation, inhalation, ingestion, or absorption through the skin. Um, now inhalation uh, is most common, you know, occupants related people who have occupations in which uh, people who work, uh, you know, their work involves uh, working in areas where there can be nanomaterials, na sorry, not nanomaterials, nanoplastics, uh, you know, aerosols which can be there, which they can inhale uh, by mistake. And um, down, it is also found that these nanoparticles need not climb the food chain only through aquatic organism. That is not only if we eat, uh, you know, shrimps or shellfishes or something. These nanoparticles are also found in beer, salt, sugar, and honey as well. Ingestion of nanoplastic uh, particles is likely to represent the main route of entry. Uh, you know, since, as I said, it can come in through seafood and also the, the food uh, which we have uh, shown on the previous slide and also drinking contaminated water. Now, not only that, it could also be leached out from the uh, plastic material it itself, which is used for storing food items. It can leach out from that as well. A very prominent example of a leaching monomer is that of bisphenol A, BPA. Now, bisphenol A is used for the production of polycarbonate drinking bottles, which is used for newborns. Now, this is a very risky thing because if you see uh, newborn kids, small uh, uh, newborns, then they have an increased uh, body burden because in their body, the accumulation is faster, elimination is less. So, it can lead to accumulation in their body as compared to that of uh, adults. 
एंट्री रूट ऑफ नैनो प्लास्टिक्स इन द ह्यूमन बॉडी सो एज एड देर आर थ्री बेसिक वो इज वन वी हैव इनहेलेशन दैट इज द लंग्स देन वी हैव स्किन एंड देन वी हैव द गेस्ट्रो इंटेस्टिनल ट्रैक्ट now the lungs basic unit is alveoli as we know so the alveoli has a surface area of around 150 meter square uh and a uh, tissue barrier that is the barrier the you can see the blood oxygen barrier the tissue barrier is around 1 micrometer thin so these nanoparticles can very easily pass through this uh, barrier and enter into the capillary blood system of the body and it can circulate not only that there was a study which was done in which uh, basically here we have the human lung epithelial cancer cell uh, on this human lung epithelial cancer cell as a study was uh, done in which you stain this so uh, what you can see stained in purple are the cells uh, the ones stained in blue are the nuclei and the yellow ones are the nanoparticles so it cannot only transmit through the uh, you know through the uh, from the lungs it cannot only transmit through that tissue barrier it can also enter inside the cells of the lung epithelial cells you know um, endocytotically or anything so uh, it is shown that it can also enter inside uh, the cells this is lung second we have the gastrointestinal tract now the gastrointestinal tract has a surface area of around 200 meter square and uh, now the uptake by the gastrointestinal tract it is uh, uh, you know related to the surrounding where the nanoparticle is there so if um what i mean to say is if there is any protein or phospholipids or carbohydrates which are around the nanoparticle the proteins will form a layer around the nanoparticle a protein coat around it protein corona around it which makes its uptake by the gastrointestinal epithelial layer easier and the third is skin now skin the upper layer is stratum corneum and uh, we know the nanoparticles are hydrophobic so it is not expected that it will transmit through the skin but uh, through hair follicles exit of sweat glands or um, through injured skin it can enter inside the body after passing through the primary tissue barriers the nanoparticles can reach the secondary organs by a process called cellular hitchhiking which basically means that these nanoparticles it's like they take a lift from the rbcs they get onto the back of rbcs and uh, it makes its circulation easier it is through van der waals force electrostatic hydrogen bonding and hydrophobic forces allow the rbcs to uh, sorry the nano nanoparticles to get onto the rbcs this also allows the nanoparticles to um, increase the time you know before it could be cleared through the liver or the spleen now liver and the spleen are pathogen clearing uh, or organs right so if it gets on to the rbcs it can avoid that so secondary barriers reach via blood stream these nanoparticles can also cross the placental barrier and also the blood brain barrier cellular uptake routes so as i said they enter inside the lung epithelial cancer cells now they can enter inside the cells as i said three routes can be there passive diffusion channel of transport protein mediated in endocytotic nanoparticle uptake which is the major route so the endocytosis is there on that picture and uh, nano sized uh, polystyrene particles can permeate easily into the lipid bilayer membranes and uh, uptake routes are not only size and surface chemistry dependent but it is also cell type specific matlab it is not only dependent on the size of the nanoparticle how it enters inside the cell is not just dependent on the size and not just dependent on the surface chemistry of the nanoparticle but also dependent on what type of cell it is trying to enter now uh, adverse effects of these uh, nanoplastics uh polymer nanoparticles as we have said uh, before that apoptosis of that muscle that it activates the innate immune system and uh, which induces inflammatory responses this is one thing innate immunity is basically uh, you know the skin tears mucus saliva so it activates this immune response whenever it enters into the body not only of humans but also of uh, you know the aquatic organisms and so on it uh, also induces the formation of a uh, large vesicle like structure so once it enters inside the cell it can also induce the formation of vesicle like structures inside the cell which blocks the protein distribution in the in the inside the cell which is responsible for cytokinesis and if cytokinesis does not take place it results in the formation of binucleated cell because cell division does not happen and the third point uh usage of joint replacement polyethylene implants so sometimes uh, prosthetics are used joint replacement implants are added in the body so if they are made of polyethylene particles over you know a certain time it can result because of wear and tear friction it can result in the formation of wear debris 
Now, this well debris can uh, result in the formation of pro-inflammatory factors in the body. Now, these pro-inflammatory factors further go and affect the bone which is there around the prosthetic or the implant, which is the periprosthetic bone, and causes osteolysis of that bone or breaking down of that bone. Uh, you know, and this in worst cases can result in the loss of the implant from its uh, position. This is a table which I put. It is. Um, it shows the various studies which were done on polystyrene, which were modified, unmodified polystyrene. The different sizes were taken. Major findings were done on how they impact uh, the cells and the uh, target or the cell line. Most of the studies were done on carcinoma cells. So this is just a glimpse of uh, the studies which were done, and just a glimpse of you know how they affect the cells. I'm sure lot and lots of more studies are there, which shows lots and lots of more impact and more harmful. And adverse effects of these nanoparticles uh, on the cells. Detection of nanopl uh, nanoplastics in the environmental samples or complex biological matrices is highly challenging. It is highly challenging because of its small size, one thing, and secondly, also because of its very close um, uh, relation in its chemical composition to that of organic matter. So it makes it more challenging to detect these nanoplastics in the environment and also in the biological systems. Now, uh, Ter Hel uh, et al. He collected water samples from North Atlantic subtropical gyre, and after ultrafiltration of the water, he used dynamic light scattering to prove the presence of nanoparticles. To evaluate the chemical identity of the particles, they first pyrolyzed that particle, broke it down into finer particles, and they used uh, gas chromatography to separate out these particles and mass spectrometry to analyze uh, what um, it constituted of. So the results uh, showed that 73% of polyvinyl chloride, 18% of polyethylene tetraphthalate, and 9% of polystyrene was found. Now, this was just one study. Um, I'm sure after that, a lot of more studies for detection of nanoplastics must have also been discovered and used. But there is still lack of a reliable method still to detect nanoplast nanoplastic particles. Coming to the conclusion, we know that information on the long-term fate of ingested nanoplastics in aquatic organisms and humans is still limited. We do not know that what happens to these nanoplastics when they enter inside the human body or, or you know, um, the aquatic systems, the body of various uh, organisms also. We still, we still do not know to a uh, very fine clarity. And uh, we do not know what happens to these nanoplastics when they enter inside the acidic conditions of the gut or when they enter inside the cells. Um, that uh, knowledge is still not known. We do not know to what extent it is leached out from the materials in which we use, uh, the, you know, the materials that we use for food storage. So all this is still um, lacking. And uh, as we have seen, but there is still a profound production, manufacturing, use, and at the same time, the same level of rec recklessness in which we are disposing of these uh, uh, materials into our oceans or, you know, in landfills. And uh, it is high time that we kind of, you know, realize where to draw the line. And um, it is also needed that a lot of more research and more studies are needed in this area so that we are able to, you know, um, understand uh, how to balance both these things and also to study what impact these um, have on our uh, um, system because when plastics were produced, they were said to revolutionize the world, you know, but now they are serving as a major, major environmental threat. So where do we draw the line? When do we draw the line? It is a question of the near future and a question of great concern. Thank you everybody for listening so patiently and attentively to the presentation. I'm, I hope I was clear and yeah, so I will stop you. Uh, thank you, Akshita. It's an, it was a nice presentation. Uh, the you. session is open uh, for the questions. Uh, yes, Dr. Pranay, you may ask the question. Thank you, Vishnu. Um, Akshita, very, very nice presentation. Thank and you, in fact, I'm very much impressed with both the students who have presented today. You have shown very good command over the language as well as the topic that you both have presented. Okay. Uh, now the question, uh, you said that microplastics are created due to the effect of the UV light, isn't it? Yes. And because the plastics are there in nature for so many years, they could have leached out microplastics, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, don't you think we don't have sufficient UV light available in nature? Because most of it is filtered out by the ozone layer. Okay, so how, how right would it be 
to compare a laboratory experiment wherein a direct UV light source is used and extrapolate that to the real environment and say that microplastics are rather produced by UV radiation. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, yeah sir, that's an amazing question. And I feel that I really agree with your point, uh, you know, on this. And um, if I were to add a little bit, you know, before choosing this topic, I was about to uh, present on the topic of ozone depletion. Uh, my topic was the impact of iodine on ozone depletion. And uh, we know that uh, ozone depletion uh, causes the entry of uh, uh, UVB, uh, medium wavelength ultraviolet light um, onto the uh, planet's surface. Yeah. So even when I was uh, actually going through that, I uh, kind of had a relation with my previous topic. So I feel that um, as we are progressing, as there is ozone depletion also, more and more UV light is, uh, uh, you know, not it is not being filtered. So more UV light is kind of entering. And uh, but I totally agree with you that the laboratory setup and extrapolating it to the real uh, world is not a very good. Uh, uh, it it yeah. doesn't make much sense. But uh, okay. I feel that, you know, as we progress, you know, because if you're considering the environmental threat and the environmental concern as a whole, there is ozone depletion as well. So as we move ahead with the ozone depleting, more UV light entering, it may kind of have, um, what to say. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 Just to I add on to this, the good news is the ozone hole depletion has really slowed down. Okay. After we have banned the chlorofluorocarbons as coolants. And since then, for the last 40 years, the recovery is very good. But what do you think about the microorganisms? Because plastics are there in the environment. Don't you think microorganisms themselves, they feed onto these plastics and in turn produce these microplastics? Could they be the culprit? Yeah, I have actually not read about microorganisms in this context, but I, I don't know if I could comment on this with, you know, uh, okay. with confidence. No, sure. yeah. yeah, no, yeah. no problem. And as a chemist, one last question. Let's say if you don't have a GCMS or a LCMS setup, how would you detect microplastics from water? What do you mm -hmm. think we can do as chemists? Mm -hmm. Okay, I have also not read about the detection. Um, um, you know, yeah, I've not gone deep into it. I would have to think about it. Okay, fine. You you have an entire year, okay, to think on this. And I, I mean, the question is, question is not just to you, but to the all the students and all the audience. Okay, we all can make an effort to find the answer. All right. Thank you so much for your nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Take care. Okay, bye. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, yes, Doctor Prane. Oh, I'm done. I'm, I'm lowering my hand now. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sandesh? Yes. Uh, thank you, Vishnu. Uh, Akshata, it was very much thought-provoking session by you. It was thank really you. a nice presentation you did. Yeah. So my question is, I think you have gone through a lot many references associated with this formation of microplastic, right? Yeah, sir. Yeah. Uh, is there any people now or scientists talking about solutions towards this microplastic? How we can, you know, convert this microplastic or biodegrade something like uh, this microplastic? Any solutions did you find? No, sir. Apart from yes, we containing use of uh, plastic and, you know, uh, throwing it into the, in the, you know, water bodies or something like that. Sorry, sir, what did you say uh, now? I couldn't hear you. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, did you find any solution? to contain the micro mm. formation of microplastic? Mm. Uh, no, sir, I'm sorry. I did not uh, read much into the solution area. You know, I yeah, I've read more into the uh, studies which were done to kind of detect and the adverse effects. But uh, yeah, I, I did not go into, if you ask me chemistry oriented solutions, you know, my, yes. my, yeah, so I, I don't know. I have not. Okay. Uh, yeah, because, yeah, sorry, because yeah. what I think is like the problem is quite evident, you know, yeah. and, and we need to find now solutions towards this particular problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can okay. I can I suggest something here, Dr. Sandesh? Yes, yes, sure, sure, Pranay. Yeah. Uh, just to give a you know something to think about to the to Akshata. You said microplastics are leached out from the plastic itself. At the end of the day, they are still plastics, isn't it? Though they are yeah. micro or nano in size. 
they are still plastic. So how about doing photo degradation further of these microplastics? Into nanoplastics. Would that be possible? Oh. Right? Convert mm. nano into even smaller until you fragment that out into monomers. Mm. Right? Then and then know. these monomers are uh, the organic polymers which have carbon hydrogen functional groups. Okay? Can't you detect them with, let's say, IR spectroscopy? You could think of detecting these, isn't it? You create monomers, you convert them into polymers. How do you monitor this reaction? Either TLC for monomers, if not, you go to IR spectroscopy, isn't it? Yes. Which should give you the idea of the functional groups and how they convert as they polymerize, right? So I'm trying to suggest solutions and answers to the questions that I and Dr. Sandesh have raised, okay? Think about it. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Amrita, you may go ahead. Akshita, am I audible to you? Yes, ma'am. Akshita, a very lovely presentation. I must say it was very thoroughly covered. I just have a okay. very small question uh, from a microbiological perspective. Maybe you have not uh, you know, come across it. But did you come across any one specific organism that has been recently studied that has the ability to degrade this plastic form? Ma'am, you're not audible. Um, you're very faint uh, voice. Okay. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yeah, yeah. All right. My simple question is, uh, it was a very lovely presentation actually. Uh, what I want to know is, did you come across any one organism which has been recently identified and studied upon quite a bit? It's a microorganism that can degrade the plastic. No, ma'am, I have actually not read about um, an organism in the current years. No. Yeah. All right. Sure, it's a yeah. microorganism. So if you get an opportunity, kindly read up on it. Yeah. Sure, ma'am. Yes, yes. Uh, is there any um, uh, more question? Uh, okay. Uh, see, I uh, uh, one of the slides uh, in which you had told that uh, many of the cosmetics uh, they have the microplastic. And uh, earlier days, I have seen that uh, they were not writing anything on the uh, bottles or the containers on which uh, these products were there. So nowadays I have seen uh, that uh, they mentioned that the product is 98% biodegradable. So it would be great whenever you are going to purchase any products like this. Uh, please have a look at the content of the material. It may help in choosing the products wisely. Thereby we can save the environment. We can contribute uh, whatever small things that we can do. Okay. Yeah. If there are any questions, then uh, you may ask. If there are no more questions, then I would like to thank all the participants and uh, the member uh, or our faculty members who have guided uh, the participants. Uh, overall, the presentations were really interesting. Uh, and I also thank all the uh, kind of uh, audience who have joined this uh, uh, our se seminar. Okay. Uh, thank, uh, thanks a lot. I. Uh, uh, declare that the sessions are uh, over. Uh, you may leave the uh, uh, Google Meet.